Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, the French have uh, an expression called uh, esprit d'escalier, um, which uh, really, to sum it up, it means uh, the kind of um, thought uh, that you uh, ideally wanted to express as an event which didn't occur to you until you were leaving. But I think we could uh, call framing the EU global strategy uh, an esprit d'escalier <laughs> in spades. Uh, it must be extremely interesting to read in view of what you have told us. Um, you are, as you say, um, an outsider to the machine, but uh, the more you spoke, uh, the more it be became clear that you were also an insider to the machine, which gives your point of view, I think, uh, a very particular uh, validity. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, if I may open the uh, floor to uh, questions or comments. Uh, anybody who wants to ask a question or make a comment, if you wouldn't mind, please, saying who you are and uh, who, what your affiliation is. And I repeat um, what I said at the beginning, uh, the exchange will be on the record. Yes, Ben. Um, as the academic, I have to ask a question. <coughs> what, would you, what would you now, knowing where you are now, what would you have done differently? I think we probably, because it was a lot of learning by doing, uh, a lot of the things were not explained sufficiently at the beginning in terms of how the process was organised. And they weren't explained because we didn't know ourselves. Uh, but if somehow one could rewind and already have that plan clear in your, your head, I think uh, it would have been useful, particularly when it comes to the member states, to explain to them um, why it was that we did things the way we did, uh, and why we felt that, for instance, circulating a text too early would have actually damaged uh, the text itself. You know, the, the reason that we gave was half true and half not. Huh? The reason that we gave uh, officially was, uh, particularly in the last stretch, was, was because of the UK referendum campaign, and we don't want to interfere in it, and we don't want leaks to happen, and leaks happen anyway, uh, and we couldn't prevent uh, front page uh, headlines on the Sunday Times saying, uh, you know, top secret plans on a European army rubbish. Huh? Um, but, but anyway, the, the real reason, I mean, beyond, I mean, that, that, was a, that was a real reason, but the other real reason why it wasn't circulated was because of this idea of protecting the text, you know, not, not, but I don't think we made, we, we explained that sufficiently. We were a bit perhaps too secretive, but not because we wanted to be secretive, but because we didn't know how we were going to organize that, that process. Um, on, on content, if I think of how the world has changed uh, since the global strategy has come out, um, I think we, uh, I think the emphasis, and again, it goes back to this Trump point. I mean, the emphasis on multilateralism, global governance are there and on the UN is there. But probably if we were to write it now, it would have a more prominent role. Uh, and although already back then we made an effort at not only pointing to the United States as a core partner, but broadening out, uh, we probably would have broadened out a, even a bit more. Hmm? Um, you know, it, uh, as a sort of other anecdote <laughs> in, in all of this, um, I remember when, you know, I think it was February or March of, uh, of 2016, uh, when, when I was beginning to write the actual text uh, itself. Uh, and Federica said to me, you know, write that text and reread every sentence, thinking if it would still be relevant post Brexit, uh, if there were to be Brexit, and if there were to be the election of Donald Trump. And of course, she was half joking when she said it. Huh? But, but I took her seriously. <laughs> I did it. But probably in retrospect, after it happened, I think the language of multilateralism would have been even stronger. And this whole idea of the EU as a defender of multilateralism would have been even stronger. Thank you. Yes, Mark. Mark Millers, I really enjoyed your, your few words. And uh, I think what was really rich about it was the diversity that you brought to it in terms of your approach. But I, I, wonder, I was wondering how important was leadership in the process? And was there ever a risk that the box would emasculate the strategy? Hmm. Um, I think that uh, we had to be 
as I said, you know, I think in terms of the actual skeleton, you know, so what are the priorities? I mean, all this came top down, to be in, in all honesty. Uh, I mean, I remember thinking about it in the summer uh, of 2015, and the work hadn't even started, and the, the table of contents was there. Uh, and it didn't change, the order changed. I, I, my, my order started global, and then it went down back home uh, to security. Uh, and then, so, you know, obviously there were changes to the table of contents, but the, the, the content remained very top down. Uh, and I think that um, it, it wouldn't, you know, it goes back to this, this idea of, you know, there needs to be a clear organizing principle to something. Um, and, and, but then the flesh has to come from everyone else. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I said, you know, if you, I think if you solicit things in a, in a different way, in a slightly less conventional way, you get extremely interesting input coming from the box. <laughs> because the box knows, you know, things that those outside the box can't know. So to me, the input that the outside the box people hmm, can give is on, on the broad brush organization of something, on the overall tone, on the discourse. But the nitty gritty detail can only come from the inside because the outside cannot know, which goes back to this idea of how much more could we learn from one another if there was more interaction. An interaction which goes beyond moments, you know, like conferences, like meetings, like, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan, for instance, of, um, uh, you know, sort of having, you know, not just having secondments of, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, people from whatever, the UN into a national foreign ministry or the EAS, but having people from think tanks and academia as, not as interns, but seconded, you know, they're there doing their work, but for six months actually understanding how that machine works and vice versa. Uh, I think there's far too little of that. And um, I'm, I, I push very strongly, particularly when it comes to the EAS, that is such a new and th therefore relatively unfossilized <laughs> structure that can therefore do this far more than at times national foreign ministries that have been there for a long time. <laughs> Yes, Peter. Um, would you care to say uh, how much UK actors, whether governmental or, or non-governmental, were significant contributors um, to the exercise, and possibly even to go further than that and uh, speculate about uh, what would be, from the 27's point of view, the best form of relationship, given that, assuming that Brexit would take place, mm. between the EU and the UK, something sui generis perhaps. Mm. So on the UK's contribution, um, actually the United Kingdom was extremely constructive in this whole process. Uh, and I, I considered it uh, an ally throughout. Uh, it was not a member, I mean, you know, there, there were a couple of points on which they were a bit difficult. Uh, the, uh, the eventual NPCC point, uh, the headquarter point, they, they had a specific problem with. Uh, there was a specific, uh, they, they were very hard on Russia. Uh, and that actually, I mean, I knew that they were hard on Russia, uh, but it was definitely on one end, mm, further out there than the Baltic countries, for example. So that, that was, but, but they were always extremely constructive and wanting to find and look for compromise. Uh, and going back to the analogy of the blanket, uh, they were, you know, they were firmly convinced that it was okay not to have 100% of, uh, <laughs> of their share of the blanket. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, so that's as far as the UK pre-Brexit. Uh, In terms of Brexit, um, I shouldn't be saying this because it's on the record. <laughs> um, but let me put it this way. Well, point number one, I cannot see a good way out. Uh, of this, um, particularly when it comes to the United Kingdom itself. Um, point number two, well, let's see if Brexit actually happens. I mean, you know, who knows? Who knows? Um, point, number, uh, point number two. Point number three, um, if Brexit were to happen, I would be extremely surprised if uh, the relationship with the EU is going to look anything like what the EU, uh, what the EU has with anyone else. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the, the, on, on the economic side of it, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult uh, to, to find a win-win agreement because 
the bargaining power between the two sides is so unequal. And we've understood how unequal it is since the referendum. We thought it was actually far more balanced than it is. Um, but when it comes to foreign and security policy, there I think there is uh, a, lot to, a lot of mutual gain uh, to be had. Um, and, and I hope, uh, but, but this is a hope, it's not, um, you know, uh, unfortunately I'm, I'm not sure it's going to materialize, um, the, the poison that will inevitably, and is already, uh, affecting the core Brexit negotiation. Uh, and that poison is there because these bargaining powers are so unequal, is not going to filter through and touch foreign and security policy. It's a hope, uh, but it's not an expectation. I mean, truth be said, it hasn't happened up until now, but it's also true that there hasn't been a negotiation when it comes to foreign security policy. Um, un surprisingly, I would say that the UK's position on this has, is and remains very constructive in theory, but it still remains extremely vague on, on the details, you know, what kind of relationship they would like to have with the, with the European Union. Um, but when it comes to CSDP traditionally understood, there I would say that, um, you know, there were plenty of very good ideas, particularly in the early 2000s, uh, before, therefore, you know, as the WU was being shut down, CSDP was coming into being just before the Eastern enlargement, in which there was discussion, for example, about how to include the Norways and Turkeys in different forms of decision shaping, but not decision making, meaning you sit around uh, the political and security committee or, or, or the council, um, and you therefore listen and maybe even participate in the discussion, but you don't have a vote, but hey, no one votes anyway. Um, so it's as good almost as being there. I mean, I think all those very good ideas, which then back then never materialized because of Cyprus and all the rest of that story, um, could actually be dusted off the shelf today when it comes to the UK. So I think on, on CSDP traditionally understood, it, I, I definitely see the scope uh, for, for a win-win. On this broader issue of what is it that European security and defense beyond CSDP is going to look like, there is more complicated. And it's more complicated because we don't quite know what the security and defense union is actually going to be in practice. I mean, we know the different bits that are being put in place, but exactly what shape all that's going to have in two, three, four, I mean, who knows how long this transition is going to uh, last, but, you know, probably quite some time. So it's difficult to imagine the relationship on that bit uh, because it's difficult, I mean, it's difficult today to really understand where we as Europeans are going to be in that part of the story. Uh, Horst? I'm Horst Sitschlag, member of the Institute. Uh, I can share some of your experiences from uh, own insight and also <laughs> involvement in uh, German policy papers like the last white paper. Uh, and I think it is now nearly fashionable to involve the, the wider public and NGOs and uh, academias in the development of these papers. Uh, but I still think uh, the success of your paper is even more commendable because it is multinational and uh, it is uh, also in a very critical time. Uh, my question is how uh, are the ideas developing? For example, I noticed in the white paper, the German white paper and in the global security, there is a new term, very fashionable, resilience. It's a kind of cross-fertilization, I think. Discussions everywhere and resilience uh, not only uh, ready to absorb shocks from outside, uh, but resilience also in view of partners. Uh, and that you mentioned the issue of interests and values uh, from my outside view if you speak about neighborhood policies, uh, there, is, there is less emphasis on human rights, democracy, more on resilience. Resilience 
translates in stability. More interest of the EU in stability of the neighborhood instead of transformation as it was in the past. Do I see it correctly that this is a policy decision? And the, the second question is top-down approach. Uh, was there any enforcement from top-down to use the term strategic autonomy? Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so very briefly on the, um, on the German uh, story. Actually, um, I forgot to mention this, uh, not so much the White Book that indeed was a parallel process to the Global Strategy, but the previous, the 2014 German Review was incredible inspiration uh, and, um, uh, to us. I mean, and many of the ideas when it came, I mean, in that case, it was not tailored to a strategy, but it was tailored uh, more, more broadly. Um, and uh, many of the ideas that we we then actually imported uh, in the process of global strategy making uh, were taken from the review. I mean, uh, I remember there was um, uh, the situation room uh, sort of experiment, uh, bringing in civil society people in a situation room time. This is something that we did. The, the uh, commissioning uh, opinions to experts, both in the case of Germany, Germans and non-Germans, in the case of the EU, EU and non-EU, yeah, is again something that, that we did. So we, that, was, that was incredible inspiration. Um, <clears throat> so on the question of uh, resilience, no, I would not uh, look at it as stability. Uh, I would look at it as, so resilience, what does it mean? Uh, resilient, if you look it up on a dictionary, uh, and the generally and you get various definitions, but a lot of it tends to then boil down to a condition that metals have. And metals are resilient when they bend without breaking. But they bend, they change. So it's, to me, resilience is a dynamic concept. So in that respect, it's not stability if stability is understood as something static. Um, but neither, and there you are right, neither is it transformative in the way in which it a transformative approach was understood in the past. Uh, indeed, because a transformative approach, which often in EU talk ended up in whatever policies of conditionality on democracy and human rights, were things that we talked about, but actually we didn't really do. So resilience to me captures um, the principal pragmatism, which is at the heart in terms of the overall philosophy of the strategy. The pragmatism cam comes from the fact that you observe things as they are, and you observe the fact that, uh, for instance, if you're looking at the evolution of a particular third country, that evolution is not linear. There are lots of ups and downs. You therefore need to have the condition of resilience to bounce back, to change, to adapt. The authoritarian state is not resilient. It may look stable. Uh, and that stability, as whatever, North Korea can last a long time, but it's ultimately, in our view, not resilient. Um, but at the same time, you are driven by your principles, and therefore you, your interpretation of resilience brings in the, the political participation and human rights and da 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 da, da you know, all, all of that. So it's, to me, it's a way of capturing both sides of this debate. And it goes back to this issue of interests and values not being disentangled from, from one another. Strategic autonomy, no, that didn't come top down at all. Uh, I wonder whether you can guess where it came from. <laughs> um, but, um, so, you know, seriously, it was uh, probably the most important thing that one particular member state was attached to, and obviously that is France. Uh, but we did not take in the French interpretation of strategic autonomy. Uh, the French interpretation of strategic autonomy tends to have a very strong industry uh, sort of uh, interpretation. Um, you know, strategic autonomy means that you buy and use and make and buy and use European. Hey, which is the European post-Brexit defense industry, which is the largest? Uh, it just so happens to be France. Um, our interpretation of strategic autonomy and the strategy and everything that came up, and particularly in the implementation plan on security and defense, is the ability of Europeans to you know, uh, promote and protect their interests and values. I mean, all the things that are in the global strategy together with partners when they can. So that's the, the choice mm, that, we, that we make. 
But if, hey, our partners don't want to partner with us, then we have to be able to do it alone when necessary. So, you know, preferably with partners, alone if necessary. And so you are autonomous strategically to uh, protect and promote your interests and values, which is not the traditional French interpretation of the term. <laughs> my name is Declan Power. I'm a security and defence analyst. And my question is, a small country like Ireland, when it comes to demystifying issues to do with European defence, that's quite an important factor here in terms of uh, the stewardship of public opinion. Oftentimes, small special interest groups would take some of the points that you made today and would distort them in such a way as to very much spook the populace. And if we needed proof of that, uh, some of the previous referendums that we've seen here and had they had to be run again were because of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So you've been telling us about how practitioners, bureaucrats, academics, uh, think tanks in particular, if I'm taking you correctly, uh, have a big role in distributing the information out in a useful way. Is there anything else, any other advice that you would have on how to bring the message in a way to influence the general public about the benefits of what uh, European defence can do, mm -hmm. particularly in terms of multilateralism mm -hmm. uh, and other things that are no-brainers, I think, for most people. Yeah. Thanks. I, I have maybe to kind of um, add on to that a bit. Um, you, you seem to be um, a tad optimistic about the prospects of um, success of this um, venture um, uh, in, in, in the shorter rather than the longer term. Um, I see a number of complications. Uh, I mean, you, you have described yourself the problems that arose for you from uh, straddling the Commission and the, uh, the member states. Uh, that is an unresolved issue. But above all, I would like to join in what uh, Declan Collar has said. There is a very big job to be done in the formation of public opinion. Um, I, you know, even when it comes to uh, Germany um, um, at the height of the concern with what um, Donald Trump had been doing, um, Angela Merkel went no further than saying, it may be that time has come for us to think of doing something for ourselves somewhat, you know. It was a very qualified kind of um, uh, reaction, I mean, a very understandable reaction. But, uh, you know, that is the reaction of the uh, head of government of the most important member state. Uh, okay, we since have had um, the intervention of Emmanuel Macron, but uh, uh, for my money, um, the public opinions in the member states are not by any means ready for this big jump. And so what do you see uh, in the shape of um, uh, arriving at that situation? Because we need that. Uh, you know, we have to get the support of our electorates for what we do. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'll first actually answer this, because then that leads me to, to answering your question, Declan. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, I think one, one observation is that actually this is an easier sell than integration in other policy areas. It's all relative in life. Um, if you look at polls, uh, what's quite striking, I mean, take your barometer, but what's striking is that more or less two-thirds across the EU uh, Public opinion supports more Europe on security and defense matters. The reason why they do, of course, differs widely from one member state to the other, but it's, I think, far easier to sell more Europe <clears throat> on foreign and security policy, including defense, than on economic integration, particularly whatever, if you go and have a conversation in Italy about this, uh, or migration, you know, I mean, on, on other policy areas. So it's all relative, uh, and this is a slightly, I think, easier one than, it, than, than, than others, and certainly than it used to uh, before. But I think you, uh, you, the, the question is, is still extremely valid, and it connects to Declan's, to my response to Declan's question. Um, which is the fact that obviously this has to be framed in the right way. Mm -hmm. And in different member states, the framing will have to be different. And the framings obviously cannot contradict one another, uh, but there will be shades because at the end of the day, uh, Europe is, is diverse. And thank God it is. 
So what are the elements of a narrative that could work, for instance, in a member state like Ireland? Um, and, and to me, there are, you know, particularly when it comes to this defence bit, and we were having a bit of this conversation over, over lunch, um, I think there are two, two elements. Element number one is this is all about an integrated, comprehensive approach. Uh, and it's not as if the European Union is going to be doing less of diplomacy and development uh, and energy and migration and research and infrastructure and dun, 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 dun. Um, that will still be there. And in fact, we have to do more of that as well. But we cannot deny that defense, particularly when it comes to the EU context, uh, was, was the sort of, um, you know, ugly duckling. Uh, and it has been the ugly duckling since 1954. <laughs> uh, and if we can all accept, and I think across the EU, EU we can all accept the fact that majorities, uh, you will always have uh, minorities everywhere, but that the defense bit is an element. Hmm? It may not be an isn't the main element uh, to fix problems, but it is an element uh, to them. Uh, and therefore, if we, if we recognize this and we recognize that this is the bit that we are weakest on, then surely we can, we can present a narrative to citizens that is, that, that is compelling. Coupled to it, um, I think the European conversation about defense is not the NATO conversation about defense. It is not about spending more on defense. That's the NATO conversation, and it regards 22 EU member states, but it's the NATO conversation. The EU conversation about defence is about spending together. And again, I think that's something that citizens can understand. I mean, citizens can understand that, actually, we spend a lot of money on defence. We spend $250 billion a year on defence, collectively. We waste between 25 and $100 billion a year of that money. So surely there is a strong logic and, and a compelling narrative, a simple narrative, to sell to citizens about how defense cooperation is actually in the interests of, uh, uh, of the public. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's, that, 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 that's sort of the answer to the, to the narrative uh, question. Um, in terms of, you know, the question of, you know, but what about, what about the divisions? I mean, of, of course, they, they're there and they, they are still uh, there. Can, can all of the, you know, the, this alignment of the stars that, that I've been mentioning, is it sufficient to overcome those divisions? And of course, I don't have an answer to that question. I mean, all I can say is that this alignment has never been there. So if there is a chance, it is now. Uh, but we will have to wait and see whether it's uh, sufficient. Um, <clears throat> but what makes me hopeful uh, that at least there is a possibility is not so much that I see and I don't see a convergence of whatever threat perceptions in Europe, a convergence of strategic cultures in Europe. No, I don't see that. Uh, I think threat perceptions will always differ uh, in Europe because uh, we are where we are in geography and that doesn't change. Strategic cultures are a product of political systems, of history, of, I mean, of so many things that again, those, I mean, I, I cannot imagine the Irish and the French strategic concepts ever <laughs> to become fully uh, convergent and one and the same. But does it, uh, is that an insurmountable obstacle? And to that, I would say, no, it's not. Uh, there is a prerequisite uh, to overcoming that obstacle, you know, the obstacle of the divisions and the differences. And I think it boils down to one word, and it's solidarity. Uh, now, if we can work on that political concept and we work on it because there is the ultimate recognition that we cannot achieve what we want to achieve at home and in the world without the help of the rest of the union because we are all small states and s small states know this, bigger states are realizing this. Mm -hmm. uh, my my uh, last anecdote from the work on the global strategy was when I inserted a sentence in the text uh, that read as a union of, well, first it read 28, and then I just took out the number, um, but as a union of small to medium-sized uh, member states, da -de -da -de -da. And, and I thought to myself, let's see how the Germans and the French and the Brits are going to react to that sentence. And they didn't change it. They didn't even suggest changing it. So I think there is this growing recognition that actually we're all small, 
and that unless we're together, and by, we can only be together through solidarity, we're lost. Thank you very much. I, I, we have to, I'm sorry, we, we have run out of time. Um, Natalie, as, a, as an outsider who has become an insider, uh, you, no, have, quiet. <laughs> you have given us uh, an, an inspirational talk and your insights have been extraordinarily valuable to us. Uh, especially, could I say, uh, your, uh, at the end, um, uh, relatively uh, optimistic uh, perspective on the future. Uh, it's a future I think we would all like to believe in, that we would all like to hope uh, that we can ar indeed arrive in solidarity at a position where Europe can pull its weight in the world united. Thank you very much. Thank you.